systems engineer for 33 years now. Uh, the entire time with Johns Hopkins. I used to work at the academic campus and now I work at Applied Physics Lab. Um, I'm glad to see we have some younger folks here tonight because one thing I want to tell people is I grew up in a very, very rural area of upstate New York. Um, didn't have a lot of the advantages like people in New York City would have or places like that. And I was able to build a career building space hardware. And I think right now I've got three different things I've worked on is actually in the Smithsonian right now. So I really want to tell people if you have a love and you want to make it happen, you can do it. You know, don't, don't feel like you're held that back because other people have advantages you don't have. Um, I'm very lucky where I made it, what I did. I'm very happy what I did, but I really want to see some other people uh, fill in for me when I hopefully retire in five years or so. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk about my instrument uh, on New Horizons, which is the LORI instrument, Long Range Reconnaissance Imager. It's most of the images you've seen till now from uh, up till now have been from my camera. And when I say my camera, it means I'm the lead engineer on it. It means it's my responsibility, anything that happens on that camera. Uh, I was in the lab, I put it together. Uh, I did a lot of the work on designing it. I uh, did a lot of the work on testing it and design and test are the big things with space hardware. And ever since it launched in 06, so what's that, uh, more than nine years ago, I've been uh, shepherding it through, making sure that we take care of it, making sure the data quality is good that comes down from it. And if you followed our encounter uh, back in July, you'll know we got some really good images and we've only got about two or 3% of them down right now. So over the next year, you're gonna see some amazing things come out as we slowly download the pictures. Uh, please ask questions. Um, you can interrupt me, don't feel like you shouldn't be doing that. Um, I'm gonna give you a little background on New Horizons. I'm gonna talk about my instrument for a while. And then I'm gonna show you science images from my instrument from Jupiter uh, and Pluto encounters. Um, and we're actually gonna go all the way back to 07 or 06 when we took our first Pluto images uh, where Pluto wasn't real exciting back then. Uh, mission background, um, we performed our flyby in July, as you know, and we're hoping that in, on New Year's Day of 2019, we'll fly by a small Kuiper Belt object. We also flew by Jupiter in 07, and we got some astounding pictures there, especially of the Moon Isle, uh, which I'll show you a couple of those later. Uh, we're the first of the New Frontiers class missions, and I think uh, the uh, Dawn mission that's at series now is another, I think it's a third of the New Horizons class. Uh, where I work, Johns Hopkins APL, uh, we were responsible for building the spacecraft, operating the spacecraft, and we built two of the seven instruments, including mine. Um, right now, we're just past Pluto. Uh, we're going to, in October, burn some fuel. So we're gonna be going towards this Kuiper Belt object that we wanna encounter in a couple of years. The earlier you perform the burn, the less fuel it takes to get there. Um, so even though we were not approved to do this mission yet, um, we're gonna do that anyway. And if you get sky and telescope or uh, astronomy, if you go back to your July issues, there were some really nice articles then. And I think the November issues of both magazines are gonna have a lot of pictures and background of uh, the encounter. So you might wanna pick those up. Okay, so New Horizons looks like this. This is the box of the spacecraft. It's about the size of a grand piano. So it's very small. The, uh, the dish on top, the radio dish for receiving and transmitting commands is, is about two meters across. Um, my instrument is here inside the spacecraft. The other instruments are all wrapped around the outside and that's gonna be important to what thing I talk about with my instrument in a little while is how we have it mounted. Uh, I think I talk about the other instruments. Yes, I do. Okay. Again, I'm an engineer, not a scientist, but, and I don't work on the other instruments, but I'll tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Alice is a UV spectrometer and it's mainly used to look at the atmosphere of Pluto. 
Uh, Ralph is a color imager and an, an IR spectrometer. So it can also take color images of Pluto and the Pluto system, and also take spectra in the IR to look for chemical compositions. Uh, the radio experiment uses our main communication dish to uh, look at the atmosphere of Pluto and measure temperatures. There's a student dust counter, which all the way to Pluto, from Earth all the way to Pluto, has been measuring the amount of dust in the solar system as we go. And the student dust counter was actually built by students at the University of Colorado. So undergraduate students and graduate students together uh, built this instrument. We have two particle instruments, uh, Pepsi and SWAP. And SWAP measures the solar wind, and Pepsi looks at energetic particles around Pluto. And that's about all I know about them. I don't, I'm not a particle guy at all. And then there's my instrument, Lori. Steve, what was the other instrument that was built by you guys? You said Pepsi. Oh, Pepsi. Okay. Yeah, we've, we've done particle instruments for a very long time. Uh, OK, so Lori is, you know, I've had a long career. Lori's the, the simplest instrument I've ever built. So those of you who know what telescopes are, if I say a Ritchie Cratian telescope, you'll know it's, it's just a Cassegrain telescope that has special mirror shapes so you don't get a uh, uh, coma as you go off axis. So an amateur astronomer can spend $1,100 and buy a Ritchie Cratian telescope the same size as the one we flew. Okay? Um, so there's nothing real special there. The only mechanism we had on our spacecraft was a door. So we have a door that protects the, space, the instrument until it launches. And then once we were, I guess, four months away from Earth, we popped the door open. We just pulled pins, so to speak, on it. And the springs opened the door. And that's the only mechanism we had on my instrument. Um, then behind the telescope, there's just a simple CCD, monochrome, panchromatic, uh, no filters. So it's as simple as it gets. So if those of you who really like numbers, so it's uh, 200 or an 8 millimeters, so it's a little over 8 inches, 8.2 inch, 8 inches, I think. Uh, it's F12 and change, if you like F numbers. The field of view is about a third of a degree squared. So it's a little postage stamp out there. It's a pretty small field of view. Uh, pixel field of view, that's how big is one pixel? It's one arc second. So it's a real easy number to, re to remember for me. Since we don't filter, we just get whatever the CCD, the silicon of the CCD can see, and that's roughly 30, uh, 350 to 900 nanometers. The detector type, the CCD we have, the only reason I put this down is amateur astronomers who buy an Apogee camera can have this exact same CCD in their amateur camera. Now, ours goes through a lot more quality steps, obviously, but, uh, and it's just a 1024 squared with 13 micron pixels, if you care about that. And we take fairly short exposures. Most of the exposures you've, you've seen from my instrument are uh, 100 milliseconds, so a tenth of a second. And the optical layout, so Rays of light come in this way. By the way, this, this is a ray trace. So those of us who do optical design, there's software that allow you to design optical hardware. And this is one of the outputs. This is just a graphical output of what happens. The rays come, they're parallel in effect coming from Pluto or whatever we're looking at. They hit a hyperbolic primary mirror and are reflected down and focused to a secondary that's also in a hyperbolic shape and it comes down to a focus where our CCD is. We have three little lenses in there so we flatten the field so it's not curved on the focal plane. OK, so the one real technical thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'll, I'll promise I'll lay off the technical stuff for a little while, is the one thing that is special about this instrument. And that's what we made it out of. If you remember, I said all the other instruments are outside the spacecraft. Lori is inside, so we're looking at deep space, or we're looking at Pluto. Pluto is, what, 40 Kelvin in temperature, so Pluto's really, really cold. If we're looking at deep space, that's 3 Kelvin, that's really, really cold. Um, the spacecraft, we run at room temperature. So there's a, 
a radioisotype generator on it that has plutonium in it that generates electricity for us. And that electricity is, in effect, eventually turned to heat. And we run our spacecraft at around 25 C inside. So that's room temperature, just temperature we're at right now. So my telescope's looking at cold space. It's inside a warm space. Oh, and then I need to run my CCD really cold as well, because CCDs want to run cold so they don't get dark current. So the little chip on the back is being run at about minus 100 C. Sorry, I'm switching units on you, but you'll have to deal with that. Um, so I'm cold, cold on both ends, and I'm warm in the middle. Now, those of you who are amateur astronomers who do imaging, do you just set up your telescope you know, you're going to image at 10 o'clock tonight. You just don't throw it out there at 10 o'clock. You let it cool off, right? Because optics don't like temperature change. So what am I doing with, with, with Lori is we're putting it in an environment where it's warm in the middle and it's warm on, or cold on both ends. Optics don't like that. Why? And the reason is optics expand and contract, and when they do, they change where the focus is. Lori doesn't have a focus mechanism. We don't have a way of turning a knob and bringing it into sharp focus. So how we focus it on the ground has to be how it's in focus during flight. So we're going to put it in an extreme environment, right? So it's mounted in a spacecraft that's close to room temperatures, looking at deep space, no focus mechanism. We get a temperature gradient across it, and we don't have a way to correct it. So what are we going to do to minimize that problem? And what we're going to do is we're going to pick a material that has special properties. So it's, the material we use is called silicon carbide. It looks like a ceramic. It's uh, very hard. It's something you can cast. So you can make a slurry of the material and put it in a mold and cast it. And you can treat it in an oven and turn it into the silicon carbide material. And then you can polish it and put aluminum on it just like any other, like a glass mirror. Um, but why did we pick that? We want to pick a material with very high thermal conductivity, a material that can move heat across it really quick, like, for example, gold and copper have this, have this property, that if you heat up one end, it moves the heat to the other end really quickly. So when you do that, it tends to equalize the temperature across something because it can move the heat really quickly. You also want to pick a material that has low coefficient of thermal expansion. So different materials expand and contract with temperature. Like you put water in a bottle and you freeze it and it breaks the bottle because the water expands. Well, things that are solids do the same thing. So if you heat up something, it grows a little bit, and you cool it off, it shrinks a little bit. Silicon carbide is one of the few materials that is very conducti high conductivity and very low CTE. It's easy to find materials that are either it's very hard to find materials that are both. Um, so we chose to use silicon carbide. Uh, we're the second civilian uh, space instrument that has used silicon carbide. Uh, those of you who know about the Rosetta mission uh, to the comet, the European mission, they were the first. Uh, so we picked a company up in New England to work with on this, and they built it. Uh, we at APL designed the telescope. We built the electronics. Well, we built a detector system, integrated it all together, and quali qualified it. Uh, qualification for a space instrument is a big deal. Um, I'm not going to talk about it in a lot of detail here, but uh, what you need to do is you need to take your instrument and subject it to all the environments uh, that it's going to see in space on the ground. What you want to do is you want to break it before you fly it. You don't really want to break it, but if it's going to break, you want it before you fly. So, you know, we built our instrument, we got it focused, and then what do we do? The first thing we do is we put it on a, a vibration table, and we shake it like you wouldn't believe, scary shaking. You see the whole instrument going up and down, faster, faster, faster. Um, and, you know, we all bite our nails, and we worry, and then we take it off of that, and we put it back in our... Uh, our lab and we measure the focus, make sure nothing changed, nothing broke. All the electronics still work. You get through that step, then you put it in a vacuum chamber that can go cold, that has liquid nitrogen shroud 
that gets down to 77 Kelvin, which is pretty close to what we're going to run, what it's going to see in space. Um, and you heat it and cool it. You heat it and cool it in vacuum. You try to break it that way. And when that's done, you take it out and you check it again for focus. You check again, make sure everything works. Um, so that is a big part of what we mean by qualify. We try to break things. So here's what Lori looks like. So this is a rendering where it's quartered, so you can see what's going on inside. So we have a silicon carbide mirror that, for those of you who know mirrors, it's an open back design. So it's a flat face sheet and then has ribs coming out the back. It's mounted in a structure that's also silicon carbide. It's the same material. That's very important to keep focus. You want all the materials that determine the focus to be the same thing. Then it has a little secondary mirror here uh, that's also silicon carbide. It has a baffle around the outside that's a composite material, like what they make tennis rackets and hockey sticks from nowadays. Um, I told you we have a, the CCD back here that detects the photons. That we need to keep cool. And the way we keep it cool is we have a radiator mounted outside the spacecraft. So imagine the spacecraft wrapped all around this to here, and then this plate is mounted to the outside of the spacecraft with a rod, a metal rod of beryllium, which is very conductive, going from this plate to the CCD. So the heat that comes into the CCD goes down this rod and gets radiated to space. So we don't need any cooling mechanisms. It's purely passive. And it's worked very well. It keeps our CCD at minus 90 C. So here's what the metering structure, which is what holds the primary mirror to the secondary mirror with the right spacing looks like. And this is all that ceramic silicon carbide material, including the mirror, both mirrors and all the material in between. This is about this big. Now you put it all together and you look down the baffle. This is what you'd see. So there's a spider that holds the secondary mirror Secondary mirrors there. These are baffle veins, so scattered light, so light from off axis. For example, after we went by Pluto, we were looking back at Pluto and the sun was only 14 degrees off, which is pretty close. So all the sunlight was coming down into here. These baffle veins keep it from hitting the optics and getting reflected and causing scattered light within our instrument. The focal plane unit, the CCD, this is the piece of silicon that detects the light here. This is the electronics that reads the data in and then sends it to our computer. This is about that big. And then here's Lori in the clean room sitting on a, a test fixture. So the test fixture here, this piece of aluminum, is the equivalent of the spacecraft. And Lori's mounted with these rods uh, in three places that hold it to the spacecraft. And here's the baffle, the outside of the baffle. Again, that's a composite material. And this is our smarts of our instrument. So there's this, in this little electronics box, there's a computer, there's an interface for the uh, imager, and then there's a power converter that turns 28 volts into 5 volts and 6 volts and 15 volts for us. This is about this big. So roughly 4 by 4. The other thing we do, so Lori doesn't change focus uh, being within the spacecraft, is we wrap it in blanketing material. So it's the whole thing, this whole thing is mounted inside the spacecraft, but we want to keep heat from the spacecraft that's warm from getting into our system. So we wrap it with multiple layers of blanketing, space blanketing material in order to do that. Okay, so, yes, sir? Quick question. So it's all under five kilograms? Uh, no, the total weight of Lori is about nine kilograms, nine. In including everything, including the harnessing, the computer, and everything. Yeah, everything you showed. Is there, did you, is there five in there? Do I need to fix uh, a typo? I might have missed it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I saw five to ten. Okay. Yeah, in, in fact, that's a good thing to bring up, though, is... The, the whole idea behind New Horizons was 
we want to get it to Pluto as quick as we can get it. Because time is money, and also we're also worried about the atmosphere on Pluto collapsing, that they think it's going to happen or may be happening now. Um, the way you do that is you build the smallest, lightest spacecraft you possibly can, and you buy the biggest rocket anybody will sell you. So <laughs> as strange as it sounds, if, if you were to see, I, I should bring a picture of this. I'm sorry for those of you who won't be able to see this on the board. But if this is the fairing of the Atlas V that we're in, I think it's of order, must be close to 20 foot in diameter and 30 foot tall or something like that. You know, you see the lower stages of Lori here going up, and then Lori looks like this in it, roughly to scale. So there's just all this empty volume in this huge rocket, because these rockets are the ones that, you know, the, the military will use or, for imaging satellites or uh, uh, maybe direct TV might use for one of their big satellites or something. And they need to big fairing to fill up for the volume where we just need a big rocket because we want to throw this thing as fast as we can at Pluto so it gets there as quick as it can. Um, but so in order to do that, you need to lower the mass. So everything needs to be as light as possible. Um, so, you know, my instrument at nine kilograms, what is that in pounds? Like 20 pounds, 22 pounds, something like that. Um, and it's a fairly good sized telescope and electronics and all. And the other instruments are all much smaller. So, you know, some of those particle instruments are palm of your hand type size. And they might weigh two pounds or something like that. Um, but so that was a big challenge is building everything as light as you can. So I'm going to uh, leave talking about my instrument now unless there are any other questions. Questions on, yes? Uh, we have our, there, there are two. There is the compressed images, the images where you're getting down just after encounter. That you, in fact, I'll show some, um, are in effect JPEG compressions. And then the vast majority of, or everything we'll be sending down after this will be uncompressed and it's just a raw format. Any other questions? Okay, so we launched in January 06. In order to get a speed boost, we needed to launch that time so we could catch Jupiter at the right point of Jupiter's orbit so we could go by Jupiter and get a gravitational assist. And we did that in February of 07, uh, and it boosted our speed about 20%. So it knocked about two years off the time it took to get to Pluto. And that's a big deal, you know, both to get the science early and also not have to pay your marching army another couple of years. Um, so that was a big deal. We made it. And the other big thing was it gave us a chance to test our instruments and how we do an encounter um, that otherwise we wouldn't have because we're not going by anything else that's close. So this shows you where we were um, when we went by. So we were just outside the orbits of, the, uh, of Callisto. And that was an exciting time because none of us knew what was going to happen. And here's some of the images we took with Laurie. And the real challenge here, interestingly enough, is Laurie was built to take pictures of a dark body 30 astronomical units from the sun. So sunlight out there is about 1 1,000th 1, as bright as it is on Earth. And here we're trying to take pictures of a fairly bright object, Jupiter, at, what, 4.5 AU? So what's that? That's a 20th as bright as Earth light, if I'm doing my math right. Um, so we had to take very, very short exposures that our instrument was not designed to do. So we had to do some real extensive image processing to take some of the smear out of our images uh, just because of the, the way our camera was designed. But in the end, we got beautiful images, like the little red spot here. Um, these are my favorites, the IO ones. Look at the volcano up here shooting, uh, what is it, uh, sulfur? sulfur compounds up, and there's another volcano here and another one here. 
And we actually took a movie. Do I have the movie in here? Oh. So, and this is the rings of Jupiter. Will this work? Oh, shoot. Okay, I apologize. Looks like that one is not going to work. But what that was going to show was we had a moon that ran around the inside of the orbit that shepherd, shepherded the uh, ring and one that went around the outside of the orbit. I'll see if I can get that going at the end. So there were some of the nice images we took at Jupiter. Now on to July and uh, the Pluto uh, Charon uh, encounter. So this is our trajectory. Now Pluto and Charon are tipped up. So they're almost, I don't want to say facing us, but they're, you know, if Earth is over here somewhere, they're not going in the same plane as the Earth. They're, tip, they're tilted up. Each one of these ticks, as we get closer to the system, with New Horizons running along the, along the red line here, is 10 minutes. So you can see, you know, here's an hour of our time. So we've, we spent, you know, nine years getting somewhere, and the heart of the encounter is a couple of hours long when we're really close to everything. So we had to do all our, all our really cool science had to happen in a very short amount of time. Okay, now I'm going to start Laurie images going way back. So six months or so after we launched, we took this one. We had to put Laurie into most sensitive mode, which is a binning mode. We turn each, each uh, four by four set of pixels into one super pixel. Um, we're still almost 30 AU from uh, Pluto. And you know, that's our Pluto image, that little dot right there. Not real exciting, but we were really happy to get it. <laughs> and then the next year, in 07, we took another picture. This time we were able to get Pluto in the highest resolution mode, where one pixel is one pixel. And again, well, it's just a dot. Not real exciting. And then we skip all the way to 13. Okay, so what's that? Six years without anything new or cool or anything like that. And finally, we can separate Pluto and Charon. Still, you know, there's no detail. It's still from Earth, from ground-based observatories, you can still get much better imaging than this. And from Hubble, of course, much better than that. Then last year, we got Pluto and Charon rotating around each other around their barycenter. So you understand that Charon is only about half the size or half the diameter of Pluto, 1,200 kilometers, and Pluto is about 2,400 kilometers. And their barycenter, the point that they rotate about, is outside of Pluto. So it makes them what they think of as a double planet. So that's why you see Pluto wobbling around there while Charon goes around the whole thing on a, a larger apparently larger orbit. So that was pretty neat, we thought. But still, we can still do better from Earth. Then in, uh, what, a year ago, we got our first images of Hydra, which is one of the smaller or mid-sized moons. And here, here's our image, right? So here's Pluto and Charon being very overexposed here. And you can just see this dot here move over here. So that was our detection there. And then this early winter, we got uh, Nix into the mix. So Hydra and Nix going around here. And again, here's very overexposed. This is, this is the real image before they process it. And this is after they process to try to get off the light, the scattered light from Pluto and Charon that are so bright compared to these little tiny moons. Then in April, um, and this one's probably not going to run either, is it? Um, in April, we first we started getting our first detail on Pluto. So here's Pluto and Charon, and if you zoom in on Pluto. You can see that there's a bright spot here, which you know, we were interpreting at the time what we knew was the, the pole of Pluto with the polar cap. It's very bright. Uh, no detail on Sharon yet, but 
we were finally getting something that's, you know, getting comparable to whatever the best we had prior to this was. Then at the end of April, beginning of May, we were able to detect the two smallest moons, Kerberos and, Hy and uh, Styx, which I guess are that one, those two. And then in early July, we had a higher resolution Styx detection. <laughs> so the rock band Styx was invited to come to our, our, uh, our mission control center, and they jumped all over this opportunity. <laughs> and uh, they were hamming it up quite a bit. And for those, by the way, for those of you who are rock fans, um, do you know who Brian May is? Anybody here of Brian May? He's the lead guitarist with Queen, I believe. And he's also an astrophysicist. He was at our science team meetings. And a uh, really nice guy, real down-to-earth guy. All right, in early May, we started having uh, more details of Pluto emerge. So you can see what just, uh, what's this, like three and a half weeks between middle of April and middle early May. Um, now, as an engineer, not being a scientist, you know, we were starting to get images in like this, and depending on the rotational phase of Pluto and Charon, you know, you'd see this. And if you didn't know Pluto was circular, you would think that, oh, there's a big chunk missing from this planet. Because, you know, as, as much as you stretch the image to try to see if there's anything there, it was just nothing. It was just black. So, you know, we knew from the Hubble images and we knew from occultation measurements that Pluto is very, very round. So, you know, the way to interpret that is two, two things to know. One is, yeah, that is a really, really dark area of Pluto right there. And also, the way we're doing the image processing doesn't give you good edges, of, especially dark edges. But every six days, we get that part of Pluto that would come around and it I keep thinking, there's got to be something going on here. Okay, so here's a series that we took in beginning, or late May and beginning of June, that just shows the rotation. So you can see, you know, even here, it almost looks like it's a, a gibbous moon or something, right? Where, but here, we're finally starting to get the bottom here. If you look closely, you can see this, this one actually does have a continuous bright area on the bottom. And then uh, Charon started showing uh, mid-June uh, cool stuff where, you know, here's the original image, and then when we do the deconvolution process, we started seeing that black area in the North Pole. And then late June, here's pictures of Pluto and Charon together. You can almost see Char Charon's here and here. Maybe we turn out the room lights for a second. And my instrument is a monochrome instrument. It's like an old black and white camera, right? I can only tell black and white. But what we can do is we can take images from the Ralph instrument, which is lower resolution, so they can't see the detail we could see. Um, but we can paint their color on our images, and that's what we've done here. So here we're starting to see the different things you might have heard referred to in the media. Um, this black area here we started calling the whale. And in a couple of images, you'll see why we called it the whale. Then there were the holes, right? These four things that looked like somebody drilled holes into Pluto. And also, you can just see part of the heart of Pluto here, uh, to the right of the whale. So about this time, there were you know, informal naming of features like that. Uh, casual names going on. Ah, this one at least works. Okay, so, you know, here's your Lori images, here's your Ralph images, and here's the merged, and we're just rotating the planet as it goes around. Here's the whale. There's the tail of the whale there. There's the spots. And here's the heart. So you can see, you know, the resolution we had with Ralph uh, but they have the nice color that changes around the planet, and when you merge it with the higher resolution, you get a really nice looking image. Then, uh, beginning of July, we started seeing just how contrasty Lori is, right? So, when we talk about contrasty, 
you know, how bright are the whites and how dark are the blacks? And, you know, these areas are, you know, as black as charcoal, and the white areas are almost as white as snow. And that's a really contrasty uh, image. Uh, and you can just see, as, again, different rotations. You can see, you know, well, for a while we were calling the donut. Later, when we got higher resolution, the donut sort of went away. And a lot more detail emerged in the tail of the whale, which you'll see. Then in uh, well, July 8th, the heart really became prominent. I mean, that's just beautiful from that angle. And then geology started becoming evident in the ninth. You can see all sorts of stuff going on in the, the tail of the whale. And then just the strip here has all sorts of complex patterns through it. And then these polygons started popping out. That, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what the explanation of those in the end is. There are a lot of ideas floating around. Now, since we're doing a flyby of Pluto that happens in hours, the really downside of that is one side of Pluto you don't get high resolution of because you go flying by it when it's away from you. So on July 11th, we got our last view of the spots because they were not on our flyby side. And if you remember the earlier pictures, they look really circular. Now you look at them in high resolution, and there are all sorts of interesting shapes going on there. And then again, more polygons, right, all over the place in here. And then uh, Sharon, uh, I, I didn't know what to expect here, but it really turned out to have some really neat features. You know, the black polar spot, these chasms, impact craters, and you know, here we are. This is still a couple of days out from closest approach. Back to Pluto. This is uh, two days before closest approach. Got cliffs, maybe a crater here. The heart is just starting to come rotating into view. And then here's our, our closest approach shot. This is the one that was released uh, the day of closest approach. It's a colorized version of the Lori image. Um, if you want to read an interesting story, the, there's a science uh, magazine article online you can get to. Uh, that talks about the release of this picture. It's very interesting to read what we had to go through behind the scenes to get this released at the time we needed to get it released. So I won't go into that story. Somebody else can tell it. <laughs> and then right after closest approach, we got some fairly high resolution images. So when we talk about the resolution of an image, um, we talk often about how large the footprint of a pixel, one single pixel of a camera would be on what you're looking at. So this image is 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels approximately. And each pixel is 400 meters. So that's, think of it as four football fields by four football fields, roughly. So that's, that's not super high resolution. I mean, if, if you and I were flying in an airplane looking down at that, it would look, you wouldn't get any detail. You wouldn't know you were flying over a, uh, a river or something like that. They would all just blend together, the pixels. Um, we still have, these are the highest resolution pictures that are on the ground now. On the spacecraft, there are ones that are five or six times better than this that you'll be seeing coming down in the next few months. So. You know, if, you, if you're looking at mountains now, these are mountains that are as high as the Rockies. You're going to start getting some detail on those mountains. And then here's the near closest approach image of Charon. And you just look at, I mean, look at this canyon or whatever here that is kilometers deep. And I forget what it is. It's like a few hundred kilometers long. All sorts of features here and then this black spot at the pole. So, you know, Pluto has a white spot at the pole, and Charon has a black spot at the pole. And then some of our images of the heart area, you can see there are small polygons here. And the engineers started calling the polygon, 
since they had these double lines, Jeep tracks, because it looks like Jeep tracks in a, a desert or something of that sort. You know, and there's hills sticking up in some of these, and there's dark areas, all sorts of interesting stuff. I was never expecting when I got on this mission to see such interesting things with closest approach. Then Nixon Hydra, the two uh, mid-sized moons. So we've put artificial color on Nix here, and it's sort of irregularly shaped. And then Hydra is almost shaped like a little rubber ducky you know, on its end in this picture here. Now these pictures uh, were affected by the compression we used, the JPEG compression we used uh, to send them down. And I think when you see them, uh, you're going to see the next month or a couple of months, you're going to see much better versions of these pictures and get much more out of them. Here's another mountain range. I think this is right on the edge of the heart, the uh, Tombao Regio. Um, and this is another one that just absolutely blew me away because I was not expecting to see what we saw here. So a, less than a day after or a day and a half after uh, we went by, we turned back and we looked at Pluto just off, oops, sorry, didn't get anybody, did I? <laughs> Let's put this down. <laughs> um, we looked back at Pluto, so imagine the sun's over here, about 14, 15 degrees off axis, and this is the atmosphere of Pluto getting backlit. And this is as large as 130 kilometers. The haze on Pluto stretches out that far. And this isn't a very good image. If you look, go online and you look, you'll see some of the really good quality versions of this image. You'll see layers in here. So there's layers in the haze of different, I assume, chemicals or materials at different heights above Pluto. So I was very happy that it was Really cool science, but I was also very happy that my instrument wasn't originally designed to be able to look that close to the sun and get images, but we got really nice images. Okay, so you've seen probably of order the high resolution images from Lori. There's probably of order 10 or 12 on the ground right now. So we took basically, after we got to Pluto, the next month or, or so, to collect engineering data and send all the engineering data down because that's easy on the personnel. Our, our personnel have been really working hard for six months or more. You know, a lot of people working, you know, weekends and nights and all that stuff. So we decided that we'd get a few images down right after encounter and then we would sort of ratchet it down a little bit, give our team a chance to rest. Um, and then Starting, actually, this past week, we've started downlinking images again, and there's only going to be a few of them coming down in uh, September. I just tried to check before this meeting to see, or Friday's usually our news release day, um, and I didn't see any new images on the news release for today. So maybe next Friday, if you want to go to our website, which is pluto.jhuedu, pluto.jhuapl.edu, excuse me, I'll write that on the board later. Um, you can check next Friday, or there's actually, if you have an Android or an Apple phone, you can get the Pluto uh, app, which is free, and you can get the information that comes down. Um, so there'll be a few more pictures in the next couple of weeks. Then we're going to get ready to do the burn, the firing of a rocket engine to point us towards this new Kuiper Belt object that we're hoping to get to in on January 1st of 2019. So that's what I'll be doing my New Year's Day that, that year. Um, so we'll do a burn, series of burns in October to do that. And then in the late fall, in November, you're going to see, start seeing regular images coming down. And I would expect that almost every Friday there's going to be a news release for a long time, like of order a year, where they're going to find new stuff or release different things from different instruments. So there's no reason, no, no reason to be concerned that you haven't seen many in, uh, images lately. You're going to see a lot of them in the next year. So what's next for New Horizons? Um, in October, like I said, we do the burn to go to KBO 2014 MU69. Pretty exciting name. And that Kuiper Belt object is roughly, I guess, a, somewhat bigger than uh, 
uh, Nixon Hydra. So it's of order 40, 60 kilometers across, so 30, 40 miles across. It's a small body. Um, in November, we're going to look back at Pluto and see if we can detect rings by back backlighting them with the sun. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence that I've heard of um, for rings so far, but they still want to you know, try to run that to the ground and do one more check. Then in April of next year, we're going to do a distant imaging of a Kuiper Belt object. So this is not the Kuiper Belt object we're going to, but we're going to look at it from a different aspect angle, where it's illuminated from the you know, sunlight going this way and New Horizons looking that way, where from Earth you're basically looking in the same direction as the sun. And we can learn things about the surface properties of the uh, KBO by doing that. So we'll be doing that starting in April. Next summer, we're going to do our calibration campaign so we can recalibrate all our instruments uh, so the Pluto data has good calibration tied to it. And if NASA approves us for this extended mission, we'll encounter that KBO on New Year's Day of 2019. And just thanks to all the people who gave me inputs, my, all my coworkers, and happy to take questions. Well, I'm an engineer, so I can, I can duck that one if I want to. Um, but I'm also an amateur astronomer, which maybe I should have mentioned in the beginning. And what I always use, and some of the astronomers will argue with me on this, is, is a dwarf rose a rose? To me, it is. So is a dwarf planet a planet? It is. It's a dwarf planet. Now, the IAU is going to say that, you know, no, a dwarf planet is not a planet. Well, I don't care. <laughs> I, you look how interesting it is, and all the things going on with it. It's, does, does it really matter? <laughs> I, I certainly think that they shouldn't have changed the rules, and if you listen to like Alan Stern, our principal investigator, you know, he'll give examples like, well, they were afraid that School kids couldn't learn 14 planets or something like that. And it's like, I, I give kids more credit than that. <laughs> and, you know, his example is, how many major rivers are there in the world? You know, are we going to say, well, we can only have nine major, or eight major rivers because that's all you can memorize in school or something. And that's not true. So I, I've kept out of that, and it doesn't matter to me because, you know, we did cool science, you know, I was in on it. I just feel so lucky and blessed that I was able to, to be part of this. The door. Yeah. So it, it just popped the pins, spring load, that was it. it never we called a one shot. Okay. Yeah, and so all, all it had was redundant springs, redundant hinges, redundant pin pullers. And all the pin pullers are, these are really simple, really cool mechanisms, actually. They're, they're just little cylinders filled with wax, and they have a plunger in them. And they're wrapped with a heating wire. And you just turn it on, and you melt the wax, and like we were, I was telling earlier, with coefficient of expansion, you change the phase of the wax from, from uh, solid to liquid, it expands a lot. So it generates a huge amount of force. And you just pull these pins away, and when it does, the door just flies open. So, so was there any kind of glass or something at the outer edge of the craft? To, or was it open? You oh, you mean once, once the door opened, you could stick your hand all the way into the primary okay. mirror? Yeah. Okay. Now, in our door, we actually we, we wimped out at the end and put a little teeny tiny window in our door. So. <laughs> Just in case our door didn't open, we would be able to take some pictures. They wouldn't be very good. But, you know, and it's funny because we made so many of those. I still have them in my office all piled up on my, my shelf that I have all these spare, spare windows we made for the door. Do you have a question? Yeah, well, going by a Kuiper Belt object, it's a lot smaller and further away, right? 
It, it's much further away. It's about yeah. 40 AU. So it's going to be dimmer. Does that mean you're going to qualitatively alter your exposure scheme as you Yeah, we will we'll, we'll certainly match our exposure. Uh, you know, we can take exposures up to 10 seconds. Um, you know, one thing I, I didn't mention is we're, we're limited in that regard because we don't have reaction wheels on our spacecraft. So we, we can't very finely move our spacecraft. What we do is we actually shoot little thrusters, little tiny micro thrusters. So we'll be pointing in one direction. We start to drift. We give it a little puff, and it goes back. So our line of sight of our instrument just wanders back and forth ever so slightly. And that's, that's really the limiting thing. That's why most of our exposures are of order tenth of a second, because it doesn't move very far in a tenth of a second. So if we're taking a one second, two second exposure, then we usually go to that four by four mode where we turn each set of four by four pixels into one big pixel. So we won't wander off you know, over the, the super pixel we're using. Yeah. What's going on with the heart? <laughs> what, what do you mean what's going on with it? <laughs> I haven't been in a science team meeting now in a month or so, so I, I don't know what the latest word is, but you know, there's, there's the talk, it's mostly uh, uh, nitrogen ice, I guess, but the uh, Sputnik plenum, I guess, is, has a lot of carbon monoxide ice blended in with it, and you know, it's supposedly a new feature, meaning it's only 100 million years old or whatever. Um, but you know, wh why is it broken up into these hexes and shapes like that? You know, there were all sorts of speculation at the time, but I have not heard anything really new there. So again, I will hide behind my engineering title and say that <laughs> that's all I know. Yeah. When are you going to know if the extended mission is approved or not? Uh, I think we have to write our proposal uh, in the winter time. And you know, however long NASA takes to review it, probably four or six months or something like that. So maybe next summer. But again, I don't have any ins inside information there. Um, we're, we're certainly funded to get our data back for the next year plus. So it's not like they're going to turn us off early. It will be before that, I'm sure. Yeah. Any good missions begun? If, if we weren't funded, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I don't know what would happen in that regard. Um, you know, would, would Bill Gates bail us out? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We'd name the mission after him? I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? So when you're trying to take images, well, whether it's in space or, or brand, you, you're doing it on the ground, you do flat fields, right? Yeah. So what do, you, what do you have? You have something in your observatory that's white that you take an image of, or do you take light of twilight or twilight? twilight? OK. So why don't you explain why you do that? Can you explain to? So we have the same problem with, with our images, that if, if we showed you a raw image that we didn't do a flat field of, there'd be what you might call dust donuts, little imperfections, little shadows, and that sort. Um, and spacecraft, whether they're spacecraft that are imaging, or orbiting the Earth and imaging the Earth, or interplanet or planetary craft like ours, how you get this flat, where you, you want to look at something that's perfectly white and flat, like, you know, almost like the lights up here, but even flatter than that. So it just looks like a uniform white. There's no good way to do it in space. There's not an extended source you can use and just point to that's, you know, what we need is a huge uniform nebula or something like that that we could just point to and take an image 
and we can use this to help process our images and make them look better. So what we have to do is we have to use the ones we took in 2005 in the laboratory. That's what we use. Um, we don't have anything better than that. You know, some of the spacecraft will fly white, white pieces of re or reflective material that they put in front of their imager. So they would sort of close the door and look at this white surface and then reopen it. Well, we didn't want to have things that opened and closed. We didn't want to take that risk and we had to keep things reasonably priced. So we didn't do that. So that's just, a, it's, it's an age old problem you have with spacecraft and any, any instrument review, imaging instrument you review with a spacecraft, that question always comes up and it's always just, there's never a perfect solution. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much, been a great audience. <laughs>